so when I gave this title, I actually wasn't sure what I was going to talk about, so I gave some cryptic title. And this is actually what it means. I want to talk to you about two things, and this is sort of echoing um, some of the things that have been said already um, this week, which is that um, if you try to make something parallel, maybe you can try to approximate it, and it's going to help you do that um, better in some way. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is greedy set cover. You know that that's kind of uh, has a linear dependency, and somehow we're going to approximate it to break the linear dependency. The other thing is um, sort of along the lines of the talk that Ali gave uh, a couple of days ago, um, and that's using ideas from streaming algorithms to make um, to solve problem in parallel. Um, let me say a little bit about the context. I'm actually thinking about creating fast parallel algorithms for shared memory machines. So these are the kind of machines that we are talking about right now. Um, and um, in reality, these machines are kind of um, messy to think about. So uh, for the purpose of this talk, we're going to be focusing on uh, simple metrics uh, like work and depth. Um, and also, I would throw in there a cache cost. Uh, I will just briefly mention what's going on there. Now, um, as we have seen already, uh, we want work to be as small as we can, basically linear or something like n log n. As for depth, you also want that thing to be uh, small. Cache cost, you want that to be small too. OK, let's dive into set cover. How many people in this room have not seen set cover before? All right, good. Um, just to recap, I'm going to talk. I'm going to be talking about the most basic version um, and weighted set cover. So this is an instance of the set cover problem. You get elements and you get sets. Um, you know that if you take all the sets, um, it's going to cover all the elements. And the task is actually simple to state. It says you want to cover all the elements using the fewest number of sets. In this case, I can pick three sets and I will cover everything. Great applications, uh, lots of things. I'll skip that for now. Uh, OK, there is a very simple algorithm to um, do set cover, and that's the greedy algorithm. It says, until everything is covered, I'm going to pick um, the set that covers the most new elements. Um, so if you run that, what happens is it's going to pick something like this. S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, S whatever. Um, this is really simple. And you can also show that this is uh, a natural log and approximation. Uh, furthermore, you can also show that you can't actually beat it unless uh, something horrible happens. So in, in a sense, this is um, one of the best things that people can do, assuming that you have a hard instance and um, p is not equal to np. Uh, this algorithm is inherently sequential. Everything you pick at, at an iteration depends on the choices you made in the previous ones. So if you're thinking about making this parallel, what can you do? First, a bad news. If you want to simulate the greedy process um, exactly, it's going to be p-complete. That has been shown before. So a lot of efforts um, have been put into approximating it. Um, there have been results of this kind. Um, so in the past, either you, you get like two times natural log and approximation, or in, in both cases, um, the work is more than the work that you would do in the sequential case. What I'm going to be talking about in this talk is a result that basically says you can get essentially log and approximation with a little more. And you get linear work. And the depth is polylock, so that gives you plenty of parallelism. The cache cost is not more expensive than uh, doing sort on M. OK, so here's how we're going to do it. The first idea is actually simple and very natural, uh, geometric bucketing. We said previously the original algorithm is going to pick the best set that covers the most uh, new elements. We're not going to do that anymore. We're going to sort of bin things um, on a geometric scale. So per iteration, we're going to identify all sets that cover at least 
say 99% are the best set. And then we're going to bulk process them in a way that uh, hopefully mimics the greedy behavior. So, so now, kind of immediately from here, you, you can see that if the best set covers t new elements, we're going to just choose the set that covers, uh, say, 1 minus epsilon times the, that t. If you, if you pick any of these sets, if you look at any one of them, they are good because you chose them from the, the sets that are almost as good as, as the best one. But the problem here is that if you take them together, there might be a lot of sharing. So you can't really uh, take everything that you, you pick up there because um, that could lead to uh, something bad. So the idea, the next idea is you actually want to uh, decide what to do. So we're going to come up with a process uh, which looks pretty much like maximal independent set, but it is not really independent. It is nearly independent. What it does is, so you have a bucket of good sets. Remember, these are things that are like, say, 0.99 um, of the best. These are the sets, and you want to sort of decide whether to accept these things, uh, make it part of your set cover, or you want to reject it. Uh, so that's what we do. The property of the things that we reject um, are that after choosing all the things that we accept, each of the reject one has, say, 99% of its original coverage remaining. And then for the other side, for each one that you accept, um, we want to show that it covers at least, say, 98% of the unique elements of the original coverage. 99 and 98 are really arbitrary. Um, it's just a placeholder for 1 minus epsilon. OK, so suppose you have this routine. Here's what you can do. First, look at the set size. Um, and then you're going to bin them according to their sizes. So you can well, send them to uh, the bucket corresponding to the sizes. OK, now I'm going to go to the uh, largest one. Here's what I'm going to do. Run manis on it. The things that manis says I'm going to accept. Um, I output that to the set cover solution. The things uh, that man, man is rejects uh, go to the next bucket. Okay, so you keep doing this. You keep doing this. Um, there can be at most log n buckets, right? Okay, so assuming that we can show that man is can be computed in linear work and some polylog depth, where uh, that's the linear in the sum of the set sizes that you feed to man is. What we can do is initial bucketing is just, well, linear work. You distribute uh, things um, over to log n buckets. As you go through the buckets, because man is this linear work, and every time a set goes from one bucket to the next one, the size of it has to, be, um, has to go down by at least 1%. You get sort of a geometric sum, so the total work is linear in the sum of the set sizes. So that's it. Uh, before I show you how manis actually work, let me actually tell you that this is actually pretty good in um, practice. So we ran some experiments on uh, some of these data sets. Uh, the biggest data set has uh, about 1.4 <coughs> billion elements and about 500 million sets. Um, okay, we are comparing three things. Standard greedy is the greedy algorithm we all know and love. DFG is something called a disk-friendly greedy algorithm. Um, this was presented in 2010 on sort of a, a memory-efficient and cache-efficient algorithm, um, which was pretty fast. And then there is parallel madness, which is um, what we are talking about in this talk. First, you can see that there is no loss in solution quality. Well, all three kind of perform roughly at the same give the same quality answers. Our solution has small overhead, at most 1.8x. I don't know what's small, at least modest. Um, and then it gives you a pretty good speed up. So on a 40 core machine, you can get between 9 and 23.4x versus itself. And it is at least, well, it is up to almost 14 times faster than the previous fastest greedy implementation. Um, okay, I'm going to spare you the proof, but here is a way to implement 
uh, the linear work menace. This is an instance of the well, set cover. You see you have a bunch of sets and elements, right? OK, the first step is each set is going to pick a random value between 0 and 1. So let's say you, you got these numbers. In the second step, each element is going to look around it and look at all the sets that it belongs to. It, it is going to extract out the maximum value um, that you can see. So each element has um, max of everything it can see. So you can sort of shade them according to the value that, that it takes. Um, and this is what you get. OK? So in the third step, you're going to accept things. Um, you can accept a set if at least 98% of that set has the same um, value as the value that, that that set gets. OK, so these guys are accepted. The green one becomes empty. And now we're going to reject things if uh, the remaining coverage is, is less than 99% of what it was before. So the green thing now is empty. We're going to reject it. So let's burn that. It's gone. And we're going to repeat until uh, the whole process removes all the sets. So that decides, uh, sets into the buckets that we accept and buckets that we reject. And that gives us order M work. This is the depth for madness. OK. Let me switch gear and talk about something kind of completely different. Um, and that's doing triangle counting in a streaming uh, graph. The problem is very simple. You want to approximate the number of triangles in a streaming graph. OK, I'm going to make some assumptions. And this is sort of a common assumption in this business, which is you have lots of triangle in that graph. And also, uh, for this talk, we're going to say that the graph is simple. No parallel edges, no loop, not, nothing like that. A streaming graph, uh, um, it, the model we're working with is basically a sequence of edges uh, just flying by you, so you, you get to observe these edges flying by you. And the broad goal here is you want to maintain some property of this graph uh, without actually remembering the whole graph. And this is well motivated because we have lots of uh, evolving data, like Twitter, like Facebook, and phone calls. And there's been a lot of prior work. Actually, a lot of them are done by people in this room, um, both in the streaming graph literature and in the static graph literature, also both in the se sequential and parallel setting. So what we're trying to do here is we want to accurately approximate a number of triangles in a streaming graph on a, sort of a smallish machine. Um, two goals here, be compact and be fast. Here's a result in terms of uh, space and time. I'm going to talk about the sequential uh, complexity first, and then talk about parallel later. M here is the number of edges. Uh, gamma is some parameter we define. I'm not going to bother with the definition in this talk. But it is bounded by the max degree. And it tends to be much smaller in social graphs because of the power law nature. Um, and tau is the number of triangles. Uh, for this talk, uh, think of gamma as being the same as the max degree in the graph. Um, and, the, and the time to process m edges is first linear in m plus essentially the space bound. And this is assuming some kind of bulk processing, which we are going to talk about later on. OK. So let me go into the first part, which is how to design a compact data structure to do this. Here is one pretty common recipe in designing uh, streaming algorithms, especially for things that uh, you just want to get uh, an estimate out of it. First step. You're going to design an estimator that has the right expectation. Okay, so in this case, you want to design a random variable t such that the expected value of t is the number of triangles. It might have a high variance, so you're going to run multiple copies of uh, this 
random variable and then combine them in some way. Let's say take median of means to improve the certainty. Uh, if you use median of means, you can see that roughly uh, you need variance of t over tau squared estimators to, uh, to get um, the desired accuracy. And, and actually, um, if you want accuracy 1 minus epsilon, the dependence is epsilon 1 over epsilon squared. Okay. So the name of the game here, at least if you follow the recipe, is to design something which has small variance. Um, to understand this idea, let's do a straw man solution. This is not re what we are going to do, but okay. Let's say here's one way to build an estimator. You pick three unique vertices randomly, and then as the edges arrive, you can check if A, B, and C ever form a triangle. This is uh, not a smart way of doing it, but you can see that the probability that A, B, C is a triangle is the number of triangles over n choose three. Okay, so in expectation, E of t is like the number of triangles. So this gives you the right expectation, but the problem is in the variance. If you run how many copies do you need to, to do this, the variance turns out to be roughly something like n cubed times the number of triangles. So according to bounds we have seen before, we need roughly n cubed over tau estimators. This is a lot of estimators, so you want something better, and that comes into reducing the variance. So we have a, a, way of, a, a pretty natural way of doing the sampling. Um, and here it goes. The first step, you pick a random edge, R1. And we're going to call that R1. So let's say this is my random edge. It goes between A and B. Uh, OK, these are the neighbors. These are things that are incident on, on that edge. We can account the number of edges incident on um, the first edge that we pick that come after it. By the way, this is a view that sort of, if you have everything up front, um, you're going to do it. But then we're going to talk about how to make it streaming later on. Uh, OK. So in this case, you can count. And let's say these three things come bef after R1, and the, the topmost guy came before it. So we're going to say three. Now, we're going to pick a random edge, R2 incident on R1, that comes after the first edge we pick. So among these three choices, we're going to pick one of them uniformly at random. So let's say I pick that guy. Uh, okay. And then finally, I'm going to, I'm going to test uh, whether that edge, the, the edge formed by R1 and R2, is ever closed by an edge that comes later on. So basically testing whether the purple edge exists in the stream. Okay. Let me name things. Um, the, the number of edges that, that instant on R1 coming after it, let me call that C. Um, I'm going to call the, the last edge, the purple one, R3. Claim. For any triangle T in the stream, the probability that, that these three edges coincide with this triangle is exactly 1 over M times uh, C. So you can think of this as a process of sampling wedges, except it's not uniform. It's actually bias. And this is how much is biased by. So you can construct an estimator by unbiasing it. And to do that, you just define T to be um, M times C of R1 and 0 um, when R1 is not found. It's easy to show that the expectation of uh, this random variable is tau. And also, you can show that the variance of it is something like m times uh, gamma times tau. So in a sense, it, it needs m times uh, gamma over tau estimators. So what I said so far is assuming you have the whole graph up, uh, up front. But in a streaming setting, you don't. So he here is. Here's how we're going to do it. The goal here is for each estimator, you, just, you want to maintain uh, just these quantities, R1, R2, R3, and the count. Well, and also globally, you want to maintain how many edges um, you have seen already. For R1, um, it's pretty easy to maintain um, using, say, reservoir sampling from uh, years ago, decades ago, actually. Uh, and the idea, if you have not seen it before, is 
let's say R1 is the current random edge. So you know by definition that uh, the probability that that thing is uh, some edge um, is 1 over m. So when you see a new edge, you know that the current total number of edges is m plus 1. So you're going to use a simple rule. It's uh, basically replace R1 with the new edge with probability of 1 over m plus 1. Otherwise, you keep the old one. So this is easy. Conceptually, you can also maintain R2 the same way, treating um, condition on R1. These are just like substreams of the thing. But that's kind of bad, right? Because if you do that in this uh, implementation, then every time an edge arrives, you're going to have to send that edge to all the estimators to, to see if uh, that um, is incident on R1 and to, to do the sampling. So that will result in something like m times um, the space bound, ignoring epsilon and delta uh, terms. So we looked into designing a, a faster algorithm. And the idea here is to bulk process edges. Let's say that a, bulk, um, that a batch of W edges arrive at a time. And, and this is sort of motivated by the fact that maybe you don't need to query it every single time instant. So you can sort of buffer everything and then process them together. And, and you can create a data structure to track the states of all the uh, estimators simultaneously. <coughs> and if you can do this in, say, linear time, linear in W, then if you set W to be like the number of estimators, the cost per edge becomes something like constant. And you get the total time um, of uh, what I claim. Let me uh, sketch how you would pick level two edges uh, from this, um, in this setting. So let's say this is the batch of edges that you, that you got. These are things that arrive together, or you pretend that they arrive together. OK, you're going to first number them so that you know which order they come in. So I'm going to number them, one, two, three, up to seven. There are seven of them. And I'm going to sort of bucket them, and then I'm going to collect, um, basically doing a sort of some sort. Uh, OK, so these are by the um, endpoints. So we got things uh, incident on A, B, C, D, and F. There's no E. We skip E. And you can order them in increasing label number. So, so let's say I want to know how many edges arrive after CF. I can just go to uh, C and then, uh, and then look at it, and then I know that there are two edges coming up after that. This process uh, can be done pretty easily in parallel using, say, uh, primitives such as sort and scan. And it takes at most sort of W plus sort of R time. W is the size of the batch, and R is the number of estimators you're maintaining. And it has polylock depth. So I'll do a quick summary of um, some experiments uh, that we did. OK, so on a reasonably large graphs, uh, we tried it up to um, about 5 billion edges. Um, we, we get a rate of about 8 million edges per second using a machine with 12 cores. And the, the error rate is less than 5% using about 2 million estimators. Um, the, the bound, I said, um, was actually very conservative. So when you actually look at the, uh, the actual estimate, it's, it's way better. But the running time is pretty, um, the bound is pretty precise. Um, the way we parallelize it uh, is, has pretty low overhead, let's say less than uh, 1.5x, and you get pretty good speed up. So on a 12-core machine, you get more than 10x consistently. Of course, on reasonably big graphs. If you're using it on, say, a million edges, maybe not. Um, the same sampling algorithms can be extended to do um, sampling. So you can sample triangles from um, the, the stream. Um, it also extends to larger cliques, of course, at the cost of more space. Um, we also have extension to considering the uh, sliding window scenario, where you, you just want, you're just interested in the 
last 25 million edges. Okay, so let me summarize. So we looked at essentially two results. Uh, one is that greedy set cover, despite being looking sequential, you can actually make it parallel by um, doing approximation on the process itself. And you lose some accuracy, but then you can go way faster than before. In the case of triangle counting, again, batching and approximation help speed it up and help you parallelize it. So now I have two open questions. Actually, there are lots of open questions that I'm listing to over here. So set cover has a natural generalization to, say, submodular cover or, or that sort of things. Um, can we get a polylog depth um, algorithm that would solve submodular cover, subject to maybe matroid constraints or whatever? Um, and for triangle counting, so even though the techniques here uh, allow deletion of, of the edges, I'm sorry, allow sliding window, it doesn't actually allow for uh, things like, let's say, let's say in the stream, there is an event that says this edge is gone. So we cannot explicitly delete edges. Can we get this kind of uh, edge deletion in the same space bound? I realize that there are sketches that allow you to delete edges, but then the space complexity is a bit more. Thank you. What's that? I have thought a bit about the submodular cover. Um, what happens there is so in this in the case of set cover, you have leverage on both the sets and the elements. So you can argue about sort of a bipartite graph and the structure on the bipartite graph. In the submodular case, it's not clear what we lose at leverage. I, I mean, I don't know what's going down, so I can't say log n rounds or something like that. There were there was another question. At least. <laughs> so I'm, I have two answers for that. First, if you think about theoretical results, um, the two bounds are not really comparable because that's the uh, sort of the additive error, and this is relative error. In practice, I haven't actually tried his algorithm, but I think that he is more specificient if you want the same accuracy. I mean, the uh, KDD paper. I don't know about speed because it's. Uh, <laughs> well, the, the, there were definitely smaller samples on those data sets right. that you described, those like 40k sort of mm -hmm. things. So just basically the square root of the number of those things. Yeah. So in practice, we don't have any actual comparison, but my sense is that the, despite the theoretical bound being inco incomparable, uh, that paper will be more space efficient if you just want the same practical. Um, guarantee. I think this is for a twelve square and R two long wall X long it's it's a track log right? yeah. All right. So if I will have one last question. If when you are correcting for the bias, mm -hmm. does it assume that the sequence comes in well spin comes in random order or can it be in any order? Any order. That that's why we have to track the number of edges that are Incident on the first edge. Right. Right. So, yeah. Thanks. Speaker again.